this is the Provoke Prawn, and this is the Lian Lee Lee Dynamic Evo. This is a case I'm revisiting with Lian Lee Lee's new SL120 V2 fans, as well as a slightly different setup from the last build, which you'll see here. Now, I've done a full in-depth build guide with this setup here with Lian Lee Lee's Infinity fans, but now I'm moving to Intel's Core i9-13900K, a new motherboard, new fans, and a slightly different setup which had some interesting implications along the way. Now, that build guide goes into a lot of depth on all the different things. In this one, I'm just going to cover a few different findings that I discovered while building in here, talk about the various different parts and some of the highlights. If you want to see more on how to build in the case, be sure to check out the video in the description, including all the information on the power supply and the setup. I am going to show some of the things of interest here because this is a great case that's relatively easy to build in. And actually the new setup with the SL120 V2 fans was slightly easier to do thanks to two different things. One, the motherboard requires slightly less power cables and two, so do the fans, which means there's more space at the back for the power supply unit, which as you'll see is a 1,500 watt PSU from Corsair. And also there are some other things that I missed in the previous video that I wanna talk about here, including how to fit the radiator to the back and the thoughts on that. Now these SL120 V2 fans, I've done a video separately on how to wire them and also an unboxing video. So I'll link to those videos in the description. And here I wanna talk about them in a little bit of detail because they are interesting in a number of ways. First, Leonie's taken these fans and upgraded them. They're slightly thicker, which means they have better cooling performance. They also have a slightly different design to them, which allows for better RGB lighting right to the edge, which means that when they're interconnected, you get a better glow across the entire thing. It also has a really good look and style to it. And the fitment and things has been changed as well. So there are a number of highlights there along the way. Now I am also using ROG Strix Z790A gaming Wi-Fi motherboard, which if you're following my videos along previously, I tried to use this only to discover it's DDR4, not DDR5 which was foolish on my part. It has D4 in its name, which means DDR4. So just be aware, if you are building a 13th gen Intel setup, you may need to look out for that because some motherboards still support DDR4. So I've got myself some Kingston Fury Beast RAM, which is DDR4, 3,600 mega transfers a second, and a few different crucial drives, because that's one of the things of interest, alongside the Intel Core i9-13900K, which was kindly supplied by Intel. And I wanna talk about the highlights of this motherboard briefly. I'm gonna do a separate video on it. But one of the things that's really cool is not only does it support DDR4, which means that potentially you could just use your current RAM if you're upgrading from a previous system, but also it has support for both PCIe Gen 5 on the top slot. So for future graphics cards, and also it has four NVMe ports built into the motherboard itself as well, which means you can install multiple different drives there. Now this Kingston Fury Beast is RGB RAM, as you will have seen from the clip at the beginning, and it's fairly nice looking too, and I found it to be pretty swift. I've got 32 gigs here. I usually use 64. I tried to use my 64 gigabytes of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 with it, and that's when I discovered the problem. But now we've got DDR4, and a few points along the way about building and the things to look out for. So this motherboard requires you to fit your RAM into DIMM A2 and B2 if you're using just two sticks. So things like that are important. If you're not aware already, I'm gonna talk about the various little things about building in a machine like this and things to watch out for, as well as the highlights of interest. This is a pretty decent motherboard for a reasonable amount of money. I found the stability to be really good. It also, as you'll see at the end, looks really nice. It's reasonably affordable and yet it delivers the goods in a number of ways. One of those is multiple NVMe slots hidden under these heat sinks. Now I've done a video separately on how to install various different NVMe's, including the Kingston KC3000 that I'm about to install here. But you need to obviously make sure you're removing any of this plastic film from both that side and from the top plate. 
And there are some other points. Usually you'll find that the top slot on a motherboard like this will give you the best performance speeds and make sure that the drive's running as it should because this is a Gen 4 drive. It should run at 7,000 megabytes per second. So you need to make sure it's installed in the right place in order to do that. Sometimes on some boards you'll find if you install multiple drives it does actually slow some of them down, so it's worth bearing in mind. But this one is meant to have PCI Gen 4 X4 on all the slots, so you should get some pretty good speed out of them. I'm going to do a video separately on it, testing the drives and other things, so be sure to check out that. Linked in the description as well. But here you can see the installation process for them, and the joys of the ROG motherboards is it basically has a little plastic clip to hold them in place. So they moved away from that sort of traditional M2 screw that you used to need. And each of these covers has its own heat sink on it, so it should allow for cooling purposes and make sure that the drives run cool. I have installed multiple drives, and there are reasons for that. I have one for Windows. I also have one for games and I have one for video and another one for a different sort of video. So I'm capturing video for YouTube videos, but I'm also capturing video for OBS footage for my gameplay channel. And I like to keep them separate because they both fill up quite quickly for different uses. Also, the speeds can vary from drive to drive because I actually am using a crucial P3 drive which is Gen 3. So you need to think about the position of where that's going to be because obviously I want the Gen 4 drives to be in the place where they're going to get the most speed whereas the gen 3 is just a bigger drive more affordable and doesn't matter so much about the speed so you sort of optimizing where things are stored now you might not use this many drives but i really like the convenience of being able to install multiple nvme drives from a personal point of view i find it useful to have them separated out like this and to have access to them and to have good speeds out of them uh, however also the other thing is that they're remarkably easy to install and that's a benefit of this sort of system these modern systems is being able to install mvme and then not bother with larger hard disk drives or with sata drives so 2.5 inch ssds for example means you don't have to worry about plugging in cables and that's the point of interest as well because this motherboard actually only has four ports for sata drives on it now i am also reusing a number of other things for this build including the kraken z73 rgb from nzxt and another highlight of this motherboard is just like the Z690 motherboards from ASUS, it has four holes, but also split into two. So it's essentially eight holes around the outside, which means that it will fit with both LGA 1200 and LGA 1700 brackets. So you can see a close look here around the CPU. You'll see there's four different points here and you can position them into the further corners for LGA 1700 or the closer ones if you're using an LGA 1200. So that means if you're reusing a previous bracket and a previous all-in-one cooler that you already have or an air cooler then you can do that without having to worry about the extra sort of additional accessories that you'd normally need so it has that benefit now the other thing here is i'm using corsair hx 1500i power supply unit i've done a video separately on the unboxing and setup of this and all the things to bear in mind including corsair's new cable for the 600 watt power supply cable for NVIDIA's 40 series graphics cards, which is purchasable separately. But this is a fantastic bit of kit because it gives you a mass of cables to plug in, which means that you can connect up loads of different things, including, you know, serious high-end graphics cards like that, but it also has just absolutely loads of cables. The benefit here I found is I stripped my case down from what I had it built in previously, and I'm rebuilding it now, and I've actually managed to reduce some of the cables that are going into the case, which meant there's a bit more room to build in, which is a point of interest, because initially this case was quite difficult to build in. If you watched that previous video, you would have seen how little room there was once I had all the cables in. But this motherboard actually has less power cables connected up to it. And theoretically, you can also use less power cables or at least less cables with the Lee and Lee fans, the new ones. And I'll show you why in a minute. Or you'll see separately if you watch the wiring guide and other things. However, this is still a massive power supply unit, as you'll see. I don't really think this case is ideal for it. You probably want a larger tower case. And to be honest, it might be more power than I need, but I am planning on upgrading to a 40 series. So you will have seen a 3090 at the beginning of this video, and I'll show some more of that off in a little while, which I've had for a while. I'm hoping to get a 40 series card at some point. We'll see how that goes. So now I'm going to go through the installation process briefly of how to install the fans. If you want to see more depth on this, 
then check out the full build guide that I did separately with the previous fans because the logic is basically the same. I'm going to intake through the bottom, exhaust out of the top, and the fan trays are all removable, as you can see. Now, Lee and Lee's SL120 V2s are really cool and very nice fans. I'm a big fan of Lee and Lee's fans because they're really easy to set up. They're basically clipped together and you can clip together four fans in sequence. So if you need to, a maximum of four per group. So you can have four groups of four connected up to the control box, which I'll show you in a bit, which means you only have one cable potentially coming out of the fans to then deal into the control box. And that makes it a lot easier where a lot of other RGB fans usually have two cables per fan, which gets really messy. Uh, Corsair, for example, their RGB fans, loads of cables and it becomes a nightmare when you've got absolutely loads of fans. So it's worth bearing in mind. Pointing these fans face down towards the bottom of the case to pull cold air in from the bottom. By the way, the case sits quite high off the desk, as you will have seen, which means that it's able to pull in air nicely and keep the case cool. And I have actually found this final setup I'm happy to report runs really well. I'm getting usually around 30 degrees C on my CPU under minimal load and about 40-ish on the GPU, the same idling. So the temp's are pretty good and that's point of interest because you will see a bit later on I'm also using an M2 expander card which partially blocks the bottom fans. And that's part of the reason why I'm going to use intake all on the all-in-one cooler that you'll see in a second. Now, the other thing that's interesting about these fans is they only have a single cable now. So there's a flat cable that comes out of it and connects up to the control box. So if you buy a triple pack of the fans, you get a control box and you also get a cable which basically has this flat connector that controls both the power and the RGB lighting. There's also capabilities to use a daisy chain cable, which I'll get to in a minute. So you can connect up two groups of these fans, potentially two of them together. So you could have six fans with basically one cable between them and then one cable leading to the control box, which means that you can reduce the number of cables going to the controller and potentially make things a bit neater in your case. But what you'll see from these angles is that this is a nice sort of thin, flat cable. It's fairly easy to manipulate. And because it's white, it also goes really nicely with this build because obviously it means white on white. You barely see the cables, a lot tidier. You'll see later on there's some black cables coming out of the Kraken cooler, which stand out a lot more than the white fan cables do. Now, I've also repeated this process for the top of the case. Obviously, same sort of logic here. I'm exhausting through the top instead, so I'm sucking the hot air out of the top and exhausting through there. There are quite a few different screws. I mentioned this in the previous video that hold these in place. On the bottom tray, there's a thumb screw. On the top, you have tiny little screws as well. So it's worth watching out for that. Now, here's a mistake that I made, and I want to talk about why. But what I was trying to demonstrate is the fact that you can have three fans, and then you can use this other connector to basically clip these together. So this enables you to clip the two fans together so you then have four fans, and then basically you just connect that one up to the back. The thing I didn't think about is then you also need another cable that runs either from that single fan or from the connector of three to the back of the case to connect up to the control box. And where I've positioned that fan means that the cable would have to come from the bottom of that single fan and run through to the back, which would be messy. Or I'd have to work it out from the top right somewhere, which would also be messy. So I've really done this the wrong way around. I should have done it the other way. I should have probably daisy chained in the other direction and sorted it out so that it would work that way. It is possible to do, and you can connect up different fans in different ways. It could also theoretically connect the top ones to the ones on the back of the case, for example. Uh, it gives you options, and that's one of the nice things about these fans, and I've gone into more depth on this in the wiring guide and talking about why it's interesting, because it basically means that theoretically you can use far less cables on the control box, which means if you've got a case like this, which is relatively small at the back, it means less cables to deal with back there. And also you can potentially keep things nice and neat. You can see that it had that mostly tucked up in the corner, for example, that daisy chain cable. Now I'm going about mounting the motherboard. And as you can see, there is a lot of room in this case. So it is a fairly compact case. It's not as small as like the Air Mini that I reviewed previously, which I really liked, by the way. But you can see with an ATX motherboard, it sort of sits in a nice way where you can have plenty of space for building in and plenty of room to manipulate cables in and to position things 
in the way you want. Also, as you'll see now, this Strix motherboard with the sort of white accents on it sits really nice in this case, and it's a perfect fit. Now, to add some more RGB in, in a time where electricity is going to cost loads of money, I decided it might be a good idea to add Lee and Lee's Strimmer RGB cables in here as well. So this is the 24 pin. I've done a video separately on these. These are the V2 Strimmers, and you can connect them up like this with the cables running to the back. I'm also going to use the cables for the graphics card as well which you'll see a little later on and the other things of highlight here about this case is it has a 90 degree angle USB-C connection but sadly the USB-A isn't so these cables need to be manipulated like that but actually ends up looking fairly neat not too messy interesting design though and on the previous motherboard that I was using here the formula motherboard that was set off to the side so it really will vary depending on what motherboard you're using but what you'll see as I mentioned earlier on is there's only four SATA ports a bit further down so now I'm connecting up all the cables from the rear and this is the two eight pin power supply cables for the CPU which connects up to the top now another point of highlight is you might not spy it but there are actually four RGB connectors two in the top right and two at the bottom left on this motherboard as well so that's worth keeping in mind because that means you've got connections for multiple different RGB things now I said earlier on that I'm reusing the Kraken Z73 this is one of my favorite coolers and one of the things that I discovered here is a few things of interest about the fans is you can remove the clips that hold the two fans together from the top so they don't get in the way of the pipes but you'll also see that you can connect up the cables to the top as well so that they'll sit underneath those pipes and what you'll notice as well if you're paying attention is that I have connected up different cables here so instead of that single cable with the flat connector that connects up to the control box I'm using the dual cables so the two cables that come with a single fan the reason for that is you can chain up those three fans so connect them up in the uni fan brackets so basically clicking them together and then you have that single cable and instead of connecting the power up to the controller as you normally would what I'm going to do here is essentially connect it up to the pump head instead so on the breakout cable from the NZXT Kraken is this basically three pronged cable connection for your fans so normally you connect up the NZXT fans but instead I'm plugging in the power for the Lee and Lee fans directly to this that enables the pump to control the fan speed and also you can connect up the pump with the AIO connection which I'll show in a minute to the motherboard so basically everything's controlled to keep the CPU cool with both control over the fans and the pump via the motherboard and via the software that means it should in theory run cooler and also those fans will spin differently to the other ones in the case which is controlled by the Lee and Lee controller so some points of note there if you're thinking about doing it because I do regularly get asked about whether or how you would connect fans on the radiator you have that option or you have the option of connecting it directly to the CPU fan header on the motherboard instead Another mistake that I made when building this case the first time was I tried to work out how to put the cooler basically with the radiator in the rear, which I believe is possible. And as someone else pointed out in the comments on that previous video, one of the things you could do is you could actually remove this rear fan bracket, then install the radiator to it, then remount it, which is not something I'd thought of doing. So you could do that and then put the rad at the back, which I think is worth considering because I've done that actually with the Dynamic Evo and with other Lee and Lee cases, essentially use the long screws to go through the fans, through the case, and into the radiator, hold it at the back. And you'll see there's actually quite a lot of space back there, so there's potential to do that. The other thing is actually removing that tray will probably make it easier to go about the installation process, because otherwise installing the radiator basically requires you to carefully balance it, hold it with one hand, and then try and screw it in through from the rear with the other small screws, which you can see me doing here. But a point of note, and it shows just how flexible this case is because you can actually remove multiple brackets and do various things with it. Now I'm applying what people will tell me is too much thermal paste, but by the way, it keeps the CPU nice and cool in my testing. And then we're seating down the Kraken. Now another point here, if you're paying attention and if you've watched both videos, is I'm actually positioning the cooler in a different way this time. And that's because I'm only using two sticks of RAM. So if you're using four sticks, one thing you may find is that the Kraken tubes push right up against the RAM stick. So if you filled all four slots, the pump tubes on the right hand side where the coolant goes in and out basically are a bit thick. So the design of the pump head is a bit big and that means that the pump cables basically push up against the RAM, which is not ideal. I have used it in previous cases with that and not had an issue. I haven't found the RAM got damaged, for example, or the motherboard got damaged, so you can do it. 
But the fact that I'm using two means that I can position them this way. Also, this makes things a little bit neater, as you'll see in a second. There's a single cable that comes out of the Kraken cooler, plugs into the AIO pump header, which is just below. So you can see that. So now I've got the pump plugged into the AIO pump header on the motherboard and the fans plugged into the pump as well. You will, however, have to go into the BIOS settings and tell the BIOS to ignore the fan speed because you do get a warning when you try and boot into Windows that the motherboard is struggling to work out the CPU fan speed. And that's because there's nothing connected to the CPU fan. Now you can see I'm manipulating those cables around the edge of the VRM at the top. Now it's worth noting this might not be the best idea. It does make things a bit neat, but that's probably going to get quite hot there. So the alternative is basically to have a mess. I wanted to see whether that would work. Now one of the other highlights of this case is the front panel connector which doesn't have multiple different pins, which just has one single connector, which is joyful and speak to how wonderful that is because it's great. Now I've got to deal with the mess at the back of the case a little bit and I need two different controllers, one for the Lian Lee SL120 V2 fans and one for the Strimmer. Now one of my complaints about those V2 fans, and I think it's worth mentioning here, is that you will struggle with the power connectors, or at least I did. So the RGB connector from the radiator fans that I showed a minute ago connects up to the sync connector, by the way, just to bear that in mind. And then the other flat connectors connect up to the various points you'd normally install it. So you can see one coming from the bottom here. What you will notice is it's really taut, so it's really tight fit. What I found essentially is the cable that connects the fans to the controller is a bit short. I wish it was longer. I found that it's a real struggle trying to position them and you'll see a bit more of that in a minute when you've plugged in all of them. Then I'm connecting up the 24 pin power cable from the PSU to the strimmer cable. Obviously that'll pass through the power and then we've got the strimmer control box as well. You'll need SATA power for that and USB connections. More on that in a second because I'm going to need multiple USB connections for this build and it's worth bearing that in mind because you will need to purchase something extra to deal with that. So you can see that this controller has a USB connection, as does the SL120 connection, as does the Kraken. So there's three, and I only have two ports on the bottom of the motherboard. I happen to have this Y splitter cable, which is actually from a Corsair build, but you can purchase little controllers, which I'll leave a link to in the description, which allow you to connect up multiple different USB headers to one control box and then plug that into your motherboard. I've seen them with two and four connectors on them potentially, so you can connect up multiple different devices. It's an additional purchase, doesn't come with a case or with the fans or anything else, but if you want to plug everything in to the USB header and then have control via both NZXT cam software for the pump and also Lee and Lee's L Connect for the RGB, then you'll need to do that. Now, it's worth noting that you don't necessarily need to because you could plug in the RGB connector from both the strimmer and the SL120 cables to the RGB headers on the motherboard and then have control via your motherboard software instead of the RGB and the power could connect up theoretically just to the motherboard power connectors but I think the USB is the best way to go with this. You do as you can see also require a lot of SATA power so make sure you've got enough SATA power connections in there because using these controllers I'm also going to use a 2.5 inch SSD despite saying I don't need to but you can see the other point of interest about this case is there isn't much room back here for ssds when you've got the setup in the way i have theoretically you can mount ssds on that tray where i've mounted the radiator you can also mount ssds and hard drives in the tray where i'm now stuffing my controllers so you could theoretically put them in there but then where are you are going to put the controllers so just keep that in mind this is a great case but there isn't a lot of room for things. If you're plugging in a lot of controllers and also a lot of drives, you're going to run out of room, I think, potentially. The case is very modular, so it allows you to install things in a variety of different places. But there isn't much room when you've got a big PSU, lots of power connections, and lots of data cables and other things going in as well. So I've stuck this 2.5 inch Samsung drive on the outside of the cage, but you also have the ability to put hard drives on the inside and you can mount SSDs in other places. So there's a back plate, for example, that goes in the back of the case. They also show that you can mount SSDs in the front and the bottom where the fan intakes are at the moment. So there's a variety of different things. I'd recommend checking out their website to see the options before you build if you don't want to build the way I have. Now I've got those streamer cables running through to the front for the RGB lighting. 
Point of note is that Lee and Lee have told me that they are working on a solution for the 40 series as well, which means that we should still be able to use some nice RGB lighting in future for those graphics cards. Because at the moment, if you're using the 40 series, you're going to need those four cables as a connector into the 600 watt connection in NVIDIA's graphics cards, which is going to ruin the RGB. But at the moment, I'm using an RTX 3090 from Gigabyte, which just still allows me to use these cables. So I'm using them because they make the case look nice and go along nicely with the SL120s. Then I've got to deal with some of the mess of the cables. And the reason I wanted to show this is just how much needs to be plugged in and how little space you have. But also, as I said earlier, this is actually better than it was the first time I built in this case. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. Now you can see me fixing the problem I had earlier on, where I tried to daisy chain that single fan to the top three. So I'm having to replace that cable with one of the other fat ones. So now I've got two fat ones instead of a single fat one, which is a shame. I also have that 5 volt RGB cable connection running through to the back. Now you connect up that, you only need to worry about doing that if you want to control the RGB lighting from the fans via your motherboard software. If you plan on using L Connect, you don't actually need to worry about that RGB connection. So it's worth keeping that in mind. There's another way of keeping your case neat. Hopefully you found some of these random tips throughout the video useful. If you have, hit that subscribe button and let me know in the comments what you've learnt, if anything and what you think of the build so far. I really appreciate the engagement and it helps support the video and the channel. So now you can see we're getting quite near the end of the build and I'm relatively pleased with how it's going. But then I'm starting to notice the issues that I'm going to have because this is where it became problematic. And this is a big point of note and something to bear in mind is that the placement of where the control box is going to be. You can see just how tight those cables are. The, these fat flat cables so there's sort of longer cables that connect up to the controller for the sl120s is just they're just not quite long enough i don't i mean i suppose it's going to vary from case to case and perhaps depending on which direction you've run your cables in but i think i'd recommend bearing this in mind before you start the build just work out where you're going to place the fan cables and where they're going to run to perhaps if i'd position them to come in from a different angle like the other way around, for example, I might not have had an issue. You can see the top ones aren't a problem. I've plugged in the top and the rear and also the RGB connection from the ones from the Kraken cooler. But now when I'm trying to connect up the bottom fans, it's really tall and it's really difficult to do. And I'm trying manipulating it around basically to run it underneath the PSU a bit more to try and give me a bit more freedom. But actually, it's still really tight. I end up having to sort of try and basically stick the controller to the underside of the hard disk drive cage I'm using stickers and you can see it there in that position as a sort of final product and then it's sort of got a power cable running across the PSU which I'm not terribly happy with not ideal setup but it isn't blocking the fan or it won't be because I'll get to slide it to the back anyway that's sort of one of the main issues I have with those fans. Otherwise, they're actually really fantastic. The RGB lighting on them is really good, as I'll show in the video. And also, as you'll see, some of the clips on it in a minute as well. And also, theoretically, a lot easier to set up than other fans and better than the previous version. So Lee and Lee fans just keep getting better and better. So here I've test booted it and everything's running as it should be. So just turn it off and get the graphics card installed. So this is Gigabyte. 3090 and I'll quickly want to point out something that was mentioned in the previous video so I bought a vertical mounting cage for this case because I want to vertically mount my GPU and show it off a bit more because it's a really nice looking GPU in that time I pointed out that there was an issue where if I did use that it would block the cooler other people have pointed out in that video thank you very much for the comments if you're watching this one I appreciate you leaving the comments on the previous one that you could actually mount that vertical bracket lower so there is a way to mount it lower in the case and then it would still be possible to mount the GPU and still be able to see the Kraken cooler as well so it is possible to do however the compromise that I would have to make is that I then wouldn't be able to use the M2 expander card so that's a hyper card which you can see here at the bottom of the case which comes with actually a formula motherboard from a previous generation that allows you to install two more NVMe SSDs Yes, I really like NVMe drives and I didn't want to lose out on that. So I had to compromise and basically not have the vertical mounting. One thing of note is you'll see that that 
drive bay is actually blocking some of the fans, but doesn't actually result in any cooling issues. So quick note about the fans, I have intake on the bottom, I've got three intakes on the bottom, I've got three intakes on the radiator, pulling cold air in through the back. I have an exhaust fan at the rear and then three exhausts at the top. So a six intake and four exhaust, just if you want to keep that in mind. And then you'll see some of the RGB lighting bleed from that. I'm going to do a video separately talking a bit more about the RGB and the controls that you can do. So be sure to check out that video linked in the description. But hopefully this has been a good view of this case and the setup tips and tricks, as well as just a general overview of what it looks like. Be sure to check out the description for more information. And thanks very much for watching. This has been the Provoke Prawn. Hope you found this video useful, interesting, hilarious, or otherwise. Take a look at these other videos that I think you might find interesting as well. And have a look at the description for links and other information you might find useful. Click that join button to see the benefits of being a member of my YouTube channel. And most importantly, have a great life.